The McElroy brothers are not experts. The McElroy there are few creators online like the McElroy family. The works of the brothers Justin, Travis, and Griffin have brought a unique blend of humor to the internet. As their influence has spread through one of the widest circles online, from the world of video games to animation, podcast, Broadway to comics, their fame brings out a strange contradiction as they have reached a level of cultural ubiquity while still being a niche enough presence that meeting and interacting with fans of them has a sense of community to it. Though unlike other online personalities with similar followings, their humor more explicitly aims to veer away from the negative and mean-spirited. The result is that no matter the avenue that people are introduced to them, there is going to be that underlying ethos of wholesomeness that makes them a much more appealing and comforting presence for many of their fans online. Now, with the subject like the McElroy family, there are a lot of great properties that are worth exploring, some which have already been covered in great places like this. And some of you might already know my personal connection with them through my engagement video. But instead of discussing any of that stuff, or their works like My Brother, My Brother and Me, The Adventure Zone, Wonderful, Monster Factory, Griffin's Minds, Trolls 2, and too many other shows to list here, I'm going to be talking about a comparatively overlooked facet of the McElroy canon. Peacecraft. Peacecraft was an 11 episode video series produced by Griffin for Polygon in 2017. Initially, the series presented a pretty straightforward premise. Griffin undergoes a pacifist playthrough of World of Warcraft, where he is unable to kill or harm any creatures as he journeys throughout the world of Azeroth. It is a similar conceit to a lot of the McElroy's other work with video games. Taking familiar series and inverting and twisting the worlds of these games into making them a highly personalized narrative about the characters acting under the watchful gaze of the brothers. See also Monster Factory and Griffin's Nuzlocke run of Pokemon Y. And this is far from a unique format on the internet and on YouTube specifically, but the humor and improv style of the McElroys do help to greatly distinguish it from other series like it. And much of the first two episodes of this series seem like they will follow a very similar cycle, as Griffin guides the lovable gnome Randy through treacherous territory while dying many, many times. Not great, holy crap! The initial conceit of this series was to have this character of Randy journey throughout the titular world of Warcraft spreading a message of peace and love to all of the different hostile creatures. However, a week after uploading the first episodes of this series, a new dimension began to develop in this series, as many other players began to reach out to Randy and even form an official guild called the Randy's Fandies, which roamed the world assisting Randy on his journey. Now, this also isn't a novel phenomenon for the McElroys, as many of their other shows have incorporated fan participation in a variety of ways. Though something that distinguished Peacecraft from previous series is how audience participation went on to greatly affect how Griffin played the character of Randy. When the Fandies first emerged as a presence within the series, there was this element of curiosity and bemusement as Randy began to meet all the different characters that emerged in reaction to the series. As this relationship between Randy and the Fandies began to develop, there was this element of shared intimacy, camaraderie, and admiration, as we get to see the luxuries that being an influential person can bring, even within the confines of a virtual environment. This is, um... So fucking righteous, everything is amazing, let's go beat World of Warcraft! But even from the beginning of this series, there were moments where it was clear to the audience that certain members of the Fandies were getting a little bit too close to this line between doing goofs and actively making the play experience more difficult and unpleasant for Randy. On one hand, a popular segment of the show is where Randy read mail from the Fandies, resulting in him becoming insanely rich 
and getting access to equipment that made his journey a lot more easy. But on the flip side, by episode 6, the sheer number of Fandies gave way to chaos within the Darkmoon Fair Coliseum, as Fandies began to actively kill Randy, resulting in him breaking his non-violent streak to do a hit. And while this went on to have some degree of humor in hindsight, there were many people that spoke out with their disappointment towards how people were treating Randy, a sentiment that many members of the Fandies shared. Regardless, this caused Randy to take a step back for a bit in favor of another character, Dr. Pete Loomis. While this characterization was framed as Loomis helping to redeem Randy's soul for doing a hit, it's also clear that it was also meant to be a time to distance himself from the rest of the Fandies. Though, after enough time to pass, Randy had decided to make a glorious return to the game, and to the Fandies, and to his mission of peace. Upon kissing Sylvanas Windrunner, Randy's message had even reached the heart of the Horde, and though he departed from the world of Azeroth thereafter, his message had been immortalized, as he will still emerge each year to assist in the great Nomarian run, as his legacy of peace continues with the Fanties, who periodically appear to celebrate his message of peace and love, notably on March 10th the following year, to celebrate something called Randy Day, where his followers celebrated with games, races, and many rainbows. All of that said, I have been making a point of specifically referring to Randy as a character by himself, even though he is concretely an entity that is managed by Griffin McElroy, a real human who dealt with the highs and lows with these interactions with the Fandies. And this cycle of fan interaction is the core of what makes Peacecraft such an interesting series to examine. If you've seen any of my other work, you know that I think a lot about the behaviors at play when examining fandoms on the internet. As I mentioned in my video about the Sars of the Young Verte, contrary to popular reactionary sentiment, extreme and toxic behavior from fandoms is not the sole product of that fandom as a group, but is also in part a result of certain behaviors that are built around how we structure online communication, namely, how certain online environments, from games to social media platforms to online communities, can encourage certain behaviors based in part on how they are structured, which I believe to be an often overlooked factor in how fandom toxicity can emerge. Now, don't get me wrong, in terms of fandom toxicity, the Randy's Fandies are amongst the mildest of mild examples of this behavior, Though, I do believe that there are characteristics to the Fandies that are illustrative of other broad trends in terms of how we see toxicity online. But to show you this, I think I need to take a little bit of a pilgrimage. <laughs> <sighs> All right, everyone. Uh, first off, this is Arland, my very first character in the game, and one that I've been playing as a pacifist. Oh, and the tiger's name is Mobs. Let's take a little trip to Dark Moon Fair, shall we? We'll talk on the way. Let's start by zooming out from just discussing the Fandies for a moment, as there has already been a lot of research conducted on player behavior within games like World of Warcraft. Since the game first emerged in 2004, people have been examining how certain behaviors are encouraged within the design of the game. On a personal anecdote of playing WoW for the first time, the very act of doing a pacifist run already presents a lot of social hindrances that occur under the game's design. First off, WoW is already a very unfriendly game for pacifists, as it is mostly impossible to do any activities that don't involve some type of fighting or competitive element. Granted, I'm playing on a PvP server, so that might influence some of my experience. Though, because the main gameplay loop centers on completely different combat-heavy tasks that necessitate the assistance of other players, it can create a social dependency towards other players to make progression move more quickly. 
even if the sort of competitive systems can make you dependent on players that can be real big dinks. On the flip side, the positive relationships that are formed in this environment have to overcome a slight social hurdle that comes with conversing with other people through the game. In the conference paper, The Rogue in the Lovely Black Dress, Intimacy in the World of Warcraft, researchers from Indiana University analyzed different player accounts of intimate experiences they had while playing the game. One of the problems they encountered is the ways that the grandeur and spectacle of these games, quests, characters, lore, and story can make it really easy for players to lose sight of the humanity and the other people they are sharing the game with. Though, they also noted, In many accounts, participants recalled moments at which they realized or remembered that there are humans behind the avatars. For these participants, avatars were able to transition from simple ludic objects or visual representations to embodied others capable of emotional expression and reception. This doesn't just apply to player characters within video games, as it can also be relevant to how internet celebrities like the McElroys are perceived. As many people have noted in other videos, links below, this phenomenon of parasocial relationships with other player characters and online personalities can create a simulacrum of a real-life relationship, where people will know certain details that can create such intimacy, while also making it really easy to ignore certain flaws or nuances that aren't easily broadcasted out. The result is a lot of people interacting in a highly competitive environment where it is easy to have a warped perception of how people are, which can cause competition for clout and attention to cross a line from affinity to aggression real quickly. And in watching this series, it is clear that many of the fannies were here because they have a strong affinity for the McElroys, which is not only evident in the references to the other McElroy shows, but also in the ways that many of the players have inserted themselves into the lore of Randy, with many pretending to be relatives, pets, and alter egos of this character. Part of this effort was to be part of the goof, but there was also a clear desire for many to be featured in these videos, and likewise to be noticed and appreciated by Griffin. Already, there is a degree of idolization that comes with being a prolific enough person, but putting this in the context of a game like WoW can greatly increase this, where the performative elements of being an online personality is increased by placing yourself in an environment where communication already has this performative element. The result was a lot of people figuring out the specific times of day when Griffin was recording, and likewise using that time to try and figure out ways to be noticed by him. Some to try and gain social clout, others to receive recognition from a person that many put on a pedestal. And speaking of pedestals... Okay, I got to the statue, but weren't there supposed to be- ah! Huh, I really need to screen my interview subjects better. Uh, anyway, uh, who are you guys? I- I'll go first. It's been a few years, but like, technically my character is Guildmaster, and also I've been like, the admin leader boy for years. I actually was never in the original 10 videos, or whatever that he did. Mm -hmm. Um, however, I was in the, like, reunion video, the, like, uh... The Randy remember, Day. Re yes, Randy Day. My character's name was Rancho, um... I You're Rancho, I okay. I only really showed up, I, it was, like, episode 8 or something, I sent him, uh, 69 Fellweed. Yeah. And that got on, <laughs> that's my one claim to fame. My that's one piece great. of proof that I was there. I distinctly remember having a conversation about bees. Yeah. <laughs> we were just like, we gotta get that good, good wet meat. Yes. <laughs> and Griffin's like, you're making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I think my favorite interaction that I had with Griffin was we were all riding in motorcycles and on the on the trail in the gnome run, and I said, This feels right. And he said, This does feel right. 
I remember being so mad when he logged in and someone raised the alarms about him logging back into the game because I was at work. <laughs> so I just was like creeping on Discord whenever I could get to my phone and trying to get people to tell me what was happening. <laughs> Oh my god. Our one friend was doing a puzzle downstairs, not at his computer, um, whenever it happened. Yeah. And he, he's mad about it to this day. Oh no! <laughs> For the purposes of maintaining the privacy of the Fandies, I will be strictly referring to them by the character names. But for some basic history, it turns out that the main person in charge of the guild was in fact Mandy who was amongst the most prominent members of the Fandies within the series. They would also serve as the main point of contact with Griffin and the rest of the guild during production. And contrary to popular belief, Griffin interacted with the members of the Fandies a lot less often than some might have expected while watching the show. There were literally people that like joined the guild and were like, so how often do you guys talk with Griffin? And we were like, um, like twice, <laughs> like twice ever. <laughs> Since then, Mandy departed and left Kiaris in charge. Though during their tenure as Guildmaster, it was noted that they were relatively lax about how often people were banned or removed from the guild. The only two notable times where people were banned from the guild was when one person was unapologetically making attack helicopter jokes and wouldn't apologize, the other being a person that was specifically harassing Randy. As we have already discussed, a big obstacle that many members of the guild encountered were the large number of people that were exclusively there to hang out with Randy, with many of them picking up the game for the first time. I feel like it was just people who logged in like once a week for two hours, just specifically so they could get on, on the raid mm -hmm. that was in that sort of same area as yeah. he was in. It really felt like a lot of people we're kind of there just like Tris said to get their 15 seconds of fame. And in recounting the Dark Moon Fair, they noted how people specifically started to attack Randy out of a desire to be seen as the bad guy and proceeded to brag about their accomplishments. It was gross. They got yelled at, and I believe they even still continue to do it, but in like more hush hush whispered tones. I remember I wasn't around for the episode, but I came onto the Discord like right after, and it was just so tense that I had no idea what had happened because the episode obviously wasn't up until like a day or two after. Yeah. Just bizarre. Yeah, yeah. That entire episode was just, well, I guess, like the second half of that entire episode was just kind of a big clusterfuck. Yeah. So that, that entire comment section is. Sometimes a little hard to read. Most of us are kind of on the socially anxious side. That really didn't help it. A lot of things took on a life of their own just because there were so many people who wanted to be a part of it. And unfortunately, this resulted in the guild becoming a lot more stringent about how people were expected to act while Griffin was logged on. Though when they recalled their moderation measures, the Vandys offered some surprising insights wasn't really as difficult as I think it would sound. I think it was it was more just like, you know, cracking the whip, make sure you, like everybody knew that there was a line in the sand. Don't cross this, otherwise you're going to get in a lot of trouble. And also there was the fact that we sort of realized that it's easier to catch flies with honey rather than vinegar. We would actively start like telling people, you know, oh, good job for doing. Like, I remember I got complimented because I got featured in the episode, but I didn't go out of my way to be a dick about it. Honestly, I don't think a lot of the rabble rousers in Griffin's videos were in the Fandies to begin with by the point I had joined. The people that were there just to like fuck around really just kind of fell off. Like, and we again, like, over like three or four years, we've only banned like two or three people maybe i mean like yeah. post the that carnival thing that was a whole different ball game we've been able to work things out really well socially generally as far as like disagreements go when it comes to toxicity online something that i think we can take for granted are the ways that shitty fans tend to not stick around long after something isn't prominent despite peacecraft coming and going a long time ago Many of the Fandies have remained close 
as the groove shifted away from this organization to just being another fan group. And at the end of the day, that is what most people are looking for when they join a fandom. And while the fandies have had some problems since then, including a Discord server purge, they still routinely play games together and have even participated in special Peacecraft anniversary celebrations called Randy Day. Like, whenever, whenever we say it's like a tight-knit group and like we have like a small like like it's more of a friend group, like literally like multiple times some of us have literally seen each other in real life. That said, there are certain actions that Blizzard and Activision could take in order to combat some of the toxicity that can be seen in the game. To give them some credit, people who are reported to be spreading overtly hateful material are often banned pretty quickly. But the problem is that such moderation is often put on the responsibility of the individual user or the guild, rather than placed in any system that could more easily manage it. And to use another online environment as an example, this is not too dissimilar to Twitter, where it is fully possible for people to block and mute particularly harmful users to self-moderate. And while this is a good thing to do to better ensure the safety of yourself and others on the platform, if an online environment is making enough money, wouldn't it be in the best interest of them to make the process easier for the user? With that in mind, given the scope of World of Warcraft and the many numbers of players that could still be subscribed, it would be next to impossible to have a human moderator on every single chat channel in every single community not without Activision Blizzard spending large amounts of money, which I don't see happening considering the fact that they aren't even willing to give large portions of their staff a living wage. Blizzard is, I wouldn't say they're incentivized, but they hi benefit highly from not automatically banning people right away. Because- Yes. Blizzard wants them let, subs. Let's, let, let's be honest, WoW subs are in the toilet, right? There's a reason that it's hidden. Yeah. Mm. There's a reason it's been hidden since what? warlords it was a uh, mid late warlords that they yeah. dropped it because it went literally the lowest it had been since like burning crusade or something they realized that people were panicking when they saw the number and then like quitting the game because of the number so they were like let's just not let anyone yeah. know anymore and i mean it's it probably to work move. probably the <laughs> problem is unless shadowlands absolutely revamps the entire game like you're gonna see like a slight spike in subs just because it's the beginning of the, the new expansion it's, yeah it's just gonna go back down again and this is where the problems of fixing this become extremely complicated island boy gave a great suggestion to implement anonymous messages to guild masters to help protect those who report abuse and harassment in the guilds or try to deal with drama others have pointed to issuing harsher bans on egregious offenders but also, I think what Kiara said was apt. It can be easier and more helpful to attract flies with honey rather than vinegar. We focus so much time and energy on the particularly negative personalities online, and the bad examples of how platforms and fandoms can become toxic. And while no one is above criticism, and certain people should be rightfully called out for their behavior, we might do well to look towards the positive personalities and forces that we see and think of the ways that we can reward such positive behavior. As the world continues to be more defined by the internet, it is going to be more important to consider the sort of behaviors that we are encouraged to partake in with whatever online environment we find ourselves in. Because of that, I think there is a lot that we can stand to learn from the Fandies and the victories and mistakes that they have made in the time during and since Peacecraft. For one, to try to not put people on pedestals, acknowledge the limitations of how you communicate on a platform, and understand the steps that online platforms can and should take to better ensure the happiness and well-being of those on the platform. As well as... Don't be mean. Like, don't be an ass. It's, it's not it's hard. A, essentially just be honest. I think one of the greatest benefits of our group is that we have never tried to identify ourselves as a family. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It's just be honest. Like, don't be afraid to, like, don't be afraid to deal out criticism. Don't be afraid to 
uh, deal out punishments. But Be able also, to deal with taking criticism and punishment so you also, don't just straight up go dictatorship. Yeah. Be mm-hmm. willing to dole out praise when it is due. Strong ground rules and like follow them. Yeah. It's not the most difficult thing. Now, don't be a deadbeat. Yeah, dad. Boundaries are important. Yeah. Alrighty then. I guess then that leads to one last question. Can I be in the guild? I have no idea what I'm doing. Ah, <sighs> well, I guess that's going to do it for us right now. I hope that you guys can stay safe and happy on and offline. Though, as the newest inducted member of the Randy's Fandies, thank you once again for watching. Best wishes. Now, if you'll excuse me, it's time for me to carry forth Randy's message and join the dance party in Ogrimmar. Let's go!